Man's forehead is the mirror of his intelligence. Archaeologist Ralph von Königswald wrote in his work, Meeting Prehistoric Man. In the early days of archaeology, there were several fossil human skulls that remain important to this day, and their discovery and description by early anthropologists is a fascinating insight into both the fossils and the archaeologists. Here are five of the most important and fascinating early human fossils ever discovered. In 1921, Swiss miner Tom Swiglar, who was searching for metal ore resources in the limestone caves of Kabwe in southern Africa, is credited with discovering Africa's earliest early human fossil. When Kabwe, also known as Broken Hill, was sent to Arthur Smith Woodward of the British Museum, he classified the specimen as a new species, Homo rhodesiensis. The original 1921 description of the skull from a paper titled A New Caveman from Rhodesia, South Africa, Smith Woodward wrote that its brain case is typically human, with a wall no thicker than that of the average European, and its capacity, though still not determined, is obviously well above the lower human limit. Its large and heavy face is even more simian in appearance than that of Neanderthal man, the great inflated brow ridges being especially prominent and prolonged, to a greater extent at the lateral angles. The newly discovered Rhodesian man may therefore revive the idea that Neanderthal man is truly an ancestor of Homo sapiens. Homo rhodesiensis retains an almost Neanderthal face in association with a more modern brain case and an up-to-date skeleton. He may prove to be the next grade after Neanderthal in the ascending series, Smith Woodward concluded. For this reason, Homo rhodesiensis is sometimes referred to as the African Neanderthal, although it demonstrates intermediate features between Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. It has been recently argued that it was the ancestor of Homo sapiens, who the ancestor of our subspecies, Homo sapiens sapiens. Kabwe man also shows features similar to Homo erectus, such as a low brain case profile, large brow ridges, a slight widening of the mid-face, known as the sagittal keel, and a protrusion at the back of the skull, called the occipital torus. But Kabwe man also resembles modern humans with a flatter, less prognathic face and larger brain, around 1,300 cubic centimetres, or about 1.4 quarts of beer. However, Kabwe man also has similarities with Asian Homo erectus specimens, like Sangiran 17 from Java, including broad zygomatics, thick supraorbital torus, a long and sloping forehead, a sagittal keel, and a broad nasal aperture. The Kabwe cranium's owner was a strong and adaptive hominid. The skull implies an incredibly robust individual with the most pronounced brow ridges of any known hominid. During this time, around 300,000 years ago, the region around Kabwe had a diversified landscape. It was a time when grasslands stretched across the African continent mixed with woods and sporadic water sources. This patchwork of ecosystems gave plentiful supplies to the land's early humans, influencing their everyday lives and survival methods. The Kabwe cranium, with its distinguishing traits, represents an important chapter in the history of human evolution. It reflects the diversity of human predecessors who formerly roamed the African continent. As archaic hominins were replaced by other hominin species, including Homo sapiens, the Kabwe individual's legacy has remained as a piece of our ancestral puzzle. Back in 1856, limestone cutters in Germany's Neander Valley uncovered the partial skeleton of a thick-boned, large, brow-ridged hominid in a cave who would be the most famous European. Hermann Schaffhausen, a German anthropologist, inspected the bones. In his paper, On the Crania of the Most Ancient Races of Man, Schaffhausen recognized that the skull differed from that of modern humans, but decided that it may belong to what he called a barbarous and savage race of people that was extinguished by a more virile form of man. He wrote that, The conclusions at which I arrived were that the extraordinary form of the skull was due to a natural confirmation hitherto not known to exist, even in the most barbarous races of man. There is no reason for supposing that the deep frontal hollow is due to any artificial flattening, such as is practiced in various modes by barbarous nations in the Old and New World. In the most ancient crania, the occipital was the most, and the frontal region the least developed, and the increase in the elevation of the latter marked the transition from barbarous to civilized man. 
He went on, a marked prominence of the supraorbital region, traces of which can be perceived even at the present time, occurs most frequently in the crania of barbarous and especially of northern races, to some of which a high antiquity must be assigned. It may fairly be supposed that a confirmation of this kind represents the faint vestiges of a primitive type, which is manifested in the most remarkable manner in the Neanderthal cranium, and which must have given the human visage an unusually savage aspect. He concluded that the fragments of crania, on account both of their anatomical conformation and of the circumstances under which they were found, may probably be assigned to a barbarous, aboriginal people which inhabited the north of Europe before the Germans. But the human bones and cranium from the Neanderthal exceed all the rest in those peculiarities of conformation which lead to the conclusion of their belonging to a barbarous and savage race. Schaffhausen, a social Darwinist, believed that humans linearly progressed from savage to civilized, and so concluded that Neanderthals were barbarous cave dwellers. However, his contemporary Irish geologist William King disagreed. King noted that the skull of this fossil, with its strong ape-like tendencies, was distinct from modern man. In 1863, King declared it a new species, which he named Homo neanderthalensis. Darkness characterized the being to which the fossil belonged, and the thoughts and desires which once dwelt within it never soared beyond those of the brute, King wrote. The Neanderthal of Neander Valley was not the first Neanderthal fossil discovery. Other Neanderthal fossils had been discovered earlier, but their true nature and significance had not been recognized, and therefore no separate species name was assigned. The name Neanderthal actually translates from the Latin word for new man and the German word for valley, after a poet and hermit named Neumann, who changed his last name to the Latin version, so the name literally means new man valley. The Neanderthal skull publication marked the start of paleoanthropology as a scientific field. In addition to its unique historical and scientific significance, this specimen has continued to serve an important role since its discovery. The original discovery gave the first proof that humans, like other species, are subject to evolutionary pressures. Indeed, it completely transformed our self-image. Nonetheless, the original bone and skull fragments, including Neanderthal man's now distinctive glowering brow ridge, was not seen by all scientists as being much different from modern humans. In fact, some scientists, including Sir Ray Lancaster of the British Museum, believed it to be an ancestor of modern humans who he referred to as the Neander Caveman. But it was not until 1885, when two more skulls of the Neanderthal type were exhumed at Spy Cave in Belgium, this time in association with the remains of cave bear, mammoth and woolly rhinoceros, did it become clear to everyone that this was an independent human type dating from the Ice Age. Von Königswald wrote that since then many further Neanderthalers, known scientifically as Homo neanderthalensis, have been found. Nowadays we know that it would be more accurate to speak of a Neanderthaloid group or a Neanderthaloid stage. The most recent representatives of this group, and they include the classical specimen from the Neanderthal Valley, lived in Europe during the height of the last glaciation about a hundred thousand years ago. Von Königswald wrote that this cold Neanderthaler asterisk is not the progenitor of modern man. His position among the Neanderthaloids is a form adapted to extreme conditions of life. But from somewhat earlier levels, such as those of the warm period before the last ice age, we know a warm Neanderthaler, whose skull is shorter and higher and who possesses less strongly marked supraorbital ridges. To this group belong the German finds at Eringsdorf and at Steinheim. This type is easily transformed into a primitive man of the modern stock that is Homo sapiens, through the Neanderthaloid features becoming less pronounced. This transition probably took place before the last ice age, for excavation on Mount Carmel brought to light a Paleolithic population in which sapiens and Neanderthalensis characteristics are so mixed that it must represent a hybrid race, he concluded. Von Königswald said, That man awakens slowly. It is 100,000 years since Neanderthal man buried his dead with solemn dignity. That the Neanderthaler believed in life after death is proved by the careful arrangement of the body, which was placed in the fetal position. 
La Chapelle au saint juan is a nearly complete male Neanderthal skeleton unearthed in France in 1908. The individual was roughly 40 years old. It is the most convincing example of a putative Neanderthal purposeful burial, but it, like all other alleged Neanderthal burials, is considered contentious. Marcel Amboule was the first to study the remains of the French Neanderthal and his reconstruction of Neanderthal anatomy based on La Chapelle au Saint material influenced common ideas of Neanderthals for more than 30 years. The La Chapelle au Saint specimen is representative of classic Western European Neanderthal physique. It is thought to be approximately 60,000 years old. Bouli's reconstruction of La Chapelle au Saint I, published between 1911 and 1913, showed Neanderthals with a skull that is thrust forward, a spine without curvature, bent hips and knees, and a diverging big toe, like in the gorilla. This representation was consistent with contemporary evolutionary scenarios in which Neanderthals were not thought to be direct relatives of modern people. Boole described it as brutish, bent-kneed, and a not fully upright biped. Boole commissioned a drawing depicting the Neanderthal as a hairy, gorilla-like creature with opposable toes, based on a skeleton already twisted by arthritis. As a result, Neanderthals were seen in succeeding decades as exceedingly primitive beings with few anatomical similarities to contemporary humans. Interestingly, Boole questioned the reconstruction of the piltdown man skull, which was eventually shown to be a fraud. Bull realized in 1915 that the jaw belonged to an ape, not an ancient human. Meanwhile, Arthur Smith Woodward of the British Museum, who would appraise the Cabo skull in 1921, was convinced the Piltdown Man was authentic. It was once believed that Neanderthaloids possibly evolved from East Asian strains of Java Man and Peking Man, and spread along the foothills of the Eurasian mountains into Europe during the lush Third Interglacial Period. After the revelation of the Homo neanderthalensis discovery in the 1860s, the Dutch physician Eugene Dubois undertook a journey to Asia with the aim to find the desired missing link between apes and humans. It would also be the first hominid find outside Europe to be known to the world. In 1890, after failing to uncover the fossils he was seeking for on Sumatra, Indonesia, he proceeded on to Java. In August 1891, Dubois began looking along the Solo River with the help of labourers and two army corporals. His crew quickly discovered a molar and a skull cap. It had a long skull with a sagittal keel and a strong brow ridge. Dubois gave them the fossil's name Anthropopithecus, meaning man-ape, at first, as the chimp was known at the time. He picked this name because a similar tooth discovered in India in 1878 had been dubbed Anthropopithecus and because Dubois initially estimated the skull to be around 700 cubic centimetres, which means it would hold only three-four of a quart of beer, making it closer to apes than humans. A year later, in August 1892, Dubois's crew discovered a lengthy femur formed like a human femur, indicating that its owner had stood erect. The bone was discovered 50 feet from the original skull cap discovery one year ago. Thinking that the three bones belonged to a single individual, Dubois dubbed the specimen Pithecanthropus erectus. In 1894, Dubois published his discovery. Pithecanthropus was a transitional creature between apes and humans, a so-called missing link, according to Dubois. Many people disagreed. Several detractors suggested that the bones belonged to an upright walking ape or a primordial human. At the time, it was believed that man did not become truly erect until his brain had developed in a very particular way to make it possible for him to use his hands. This conclusion made sense at a period when scientists tended to consider hominid fossils as local varieties of contemporary humans rather than ancestral forms. The skulls were damaged, but it is unknown whether this was due to an assault, cannibalism, the volcanic eruption, or the fossilization process. Von Königswald observed major injuries in skulls, which they attributed to a cutting tool and a blunt instrument, respectively. They show signs of inflammation and healing, indicating that the individual survived the altercation. Von Königswald noted that only the skull caps were discovered, with no teeth, 
which is extremely unusual. As a result, they interpreted the skulls as victims of an unsuccessful assault, and the other skulls where the base was broken out as the result of more successful attempts to slay the victims, assuming this was done by other humans to access and consume the brain. They didn't know whether this was done by a neighboring Homo erectus tribe or by more advanced human beings who would have given evidence of their superior culture by slaying their more primitive fellow man. Then, in 1927, archaeologists recognized two fossilized teeth discovered in Chukudian Cave near Beijing as belonging to an early human and named the specimen Sinanthropus pekinensis, popularly known as Peking Man. The first of several skullcaps was discovered on the same site in December 1929, and it was similar but somewhat larger than Java Man. Peking Man and Peking Woman lived 500,000 years ago, and by our standards she was hardly a beauty. But she was our ancestor, and his descendants have no reason to be embarrassed by her cultural level. She walked upright like a modern man, rather than stooping and shambling like an ape. The brain inside that oddly shaped skull was relatively small, yet it was still clearly within the human size range. Peking man could build tools in his simple way. For her chores she used stone knives and hatchets. Eking woman, far removed from the mental level of primates, knew how to produce fire, the greatest single discovery of the human race. The fossilized remains, now known as Homo erectus pekinensis, spent the 1930s in China, where paleontologists and anthropologists pondered them. Multiple skulls, lower jaws and teeth were discovered in a cave. Homo erectus remains were discovered in Java, but some experts thought they were just an odd or deformed ape species. Peking man put an end to that line of thought, making him a cultural and scientific treasure. Peking man possessed ape-like teeth and jaws and ate animals, nuts, seeds, and, on rare occasions, other humans. Peking man is the oldest known human race and the direct ancestor of modern man. Von Königswald studied the Java man and Peking man fossils and determined that they were closely related. No other paleontological discovery has created such a sensation and led to such a variety of conflicting scientific opinions, Von Königswald recalled more than 50 years after Dubois' discovery. The Pithecanthropus fossils sparked such interest and outrage that by the end of the 1890s nearly 80 articles had already addressed them. Some scientists at the time speculated that Dubois's Java Man was a possible transitional stage between current humans and our shared ancestor with the other big apes. Dubois, like many other scientists at the time who believed that modern humans evolved out of Asia, claimed that gibbons were the closest living relatives of humans among the big apes. And with that tantalizing statement, we leave you to ponder the mysteries of our shared human heritage. Until next time, please check out the other videos on our channel. Please leave a comment. Thank you for the support and take care.